thanks for the introduction. So as already said, today I'm talking about JavaScript template attacks, which gives us an automated way of finding information about the environment from JavaScript to make exploits and side channel attacks and also fingerprinting more easy in a more automated way. So if you talk about JavaScript, um, then we have a lot of things that we can nowadays do in JavaScript. We find a lot of functionality, a lot of properties. We have many, many properties we can access from the JavaScript language. And these properties are usually just to give us some information, but they should not leak information about the environment in which our browser, our JavaScript engine is running. So they only provide information like a date or other functionalities that we can access everywhere, but don't uh, provide any information about the operating system or the hardware that the engine is running on. Because if we have that, we could use that information to target our exploits if we have browser exploits that exploit some flaws in the JavaScript interpreter and the just-in-time compiler or in the browser, and we can better target them if we know on which environment, which hardware, which software they use using, then we can target them more precisely. The same is true for side channel attacks, where we need a lot of information about the environment to actually mount a successful side channel attack. And these properties, if they leak environmental information, they can also be used for fingerprinting, because then we can track users across websites, for example. In theory, we have this JavaScript sandbox that is agnostic of the environment. So if we execute code, it should give us basically the same result, no matter what environment we have, no matter the software, the hardware, running outside the JavaScript interpreter. So the same code has the same results in all the operating systems when we use the same browser. It should all also be the same in different browsers across different environments. It's not always the case, but especially in one browser, it should be the same across environments. For example, if you're talking about function names or property names, an array should always be called array. So the name of an array is array on all the environments. We, of course, have some defined exceptions to that. So we have properties that give us information about the environment, such as the user agent, which tells us the browser version or the environment. But this can easily be faked by the user, and it's often done so for privacy reasons. Especially if you're talking about the Tor browser. So the Tor browser tries to anonymize all the properties so that we don't have any chance to know anything about the environment. So all the properties on all the environments are completely the same. What happens if that is not the case? What happens if such properties in JavaScript leak <coughs> information about the hardware or the software? Then we can use that to track users because we can see this configuration of the environment uh, throughout websites. And we can make phishing more plausible. So if we have phishing dialogues on websites, there was also a paper about that, um, that knows exactly what operating system you're using, which browser version you're using, which extensions you're using, which CPU you have, which graphic card you have, they can build quite plausible phishing dialogues for you. It allows to fit exploits to the user, so if we exactly know what the environment looks like, which architecture the user is using, we can select the correct exploits to exploit a user visiting our page. And it also uh, provides us with the information that we can use for side channel attacks. So leaking information uh, using these properties gives us an indirect security risk in JavaScript. So we know that for quite some while and we have searched for them in a non-automated way, manually, checking which properties have differences. There are many, many papers about fingerprinting. And all the papers find some differences here and there. But this is time consuming. So the idea is to automate this approach because automating something is always something that saves us a lot of time. And we do this in the way of a template attack. And the ideas of the template, a template attack is that we change one factor and do the measurement again, and then we change the factor of the environment and do the measurements again and read everything again, and then we look for differences. So this is the basic idea of JavaScript template attacks. <coughs> so how does this work? It's a few steps involved that we use to find these leaking properties. First, we explore all the properties. So we look which properties do we have which are accessible from JavaScript. And if we have such a list of properties we can access, 
we collect the values on different environments and build such a template. Um, then we clean the template a bit up, remove all the duplicates, for example, and then we see which properties have a different value on different environments when everything else stays the same. And with this, we can extract properties that are leaking actual information about the environment. So let's get into a bit more of detail of those phases. In the first phase, the profiling phase, we extract all the properties that we can access in JavaScript. For example, as seen before, this window array dot name is one of the properties. And we do that using reflections, so we can access all the, uh, the objects in, in JavaScript in the interpreter, and we can go through all the properties and all the functions of these objects and get a list of all the objects. Um, we do that recursively, so we basically get a list of all the things we can access in the JavaScript sandbox. If we've done that, it's a huge list then, we can also collect all the values of those properties and save them in uh, a huge database. So then we have a list of properties for one environment and then we start changing the environment. So we use a different operating system, we use different hardware configuration, uh, we install different extensions in the browser for example and repeat this measurement process so the acquiring of all the values of the properties we have. And this gives us then a huge table. In this table, the rows are the properties and the columns are the environments. So that might, a piece of this table might look like that. We have the properties we collected first in the explore, explore, exploration phase, like the window array name or the window window array name, the navigator platform, the performance time origin, or window shared workers. And for the first environment, uh, we get some values for those properties. In the second environment, we might get same, same values for the properties or different values for the properties. In the third environment, it's the same again. So we can already see, if you're looking at that, that we get sometimes the same properties, sometimes different properties. So this already gives us a hint that the environment plays a role in the values of those properties that can later be used for targeted attacks. Then we have to clean up this template because we collected a lot of properties. Some of them are duplicates. Some of them are non-static values, like we collected timestamps. We can't really use timestamps for anything useful. So we clean up this template and get rid of all the things that we don't need here. For example here, we have this duplicate value in the first and the second row that we don't need because it refers to the same property. It's just an alias. Or as I said before, timestamps are not especially useful because they change on every run of this script. So if we collect it, we get a lot of different values and we can't really infer something from a timestamp. If we cleaned up the template, we are left with a lot of templates, uh, with a lot of properties, and we see that this, there are actually a lot of properties that we can access from JavaScript. So here are some of the browsers we tested, and on the first column, we see how many properties are documented currently on the Mozilla Developer Network. We see it's around 2,000 properties per browser, and on the right column, we see how many we actually find. So we find a lot of not documented properties uh, that are there that can be accessed via JavaScript, but they're just not documented. Some internal st uh, things that don't have to be documented and some duplicate values that are not needed to be documented. But we can see we can access around 15,000 properties from within the JavaScript sandbox. So this is quite a lot. And if you look at the trend, it's not getting to be fewer properties, but with every browser version, more and more functionality is added to the JavaScript interpreter and the just-in-time compiler. So we have access to more and more functions and more and more properties. And we see that are the two major browsers with Firefox and Chrome, and the number of properties increases in every version number. So we get more and more data with more potential to leak information about the environment. So if we have collected all of that, we still need to make sense of this template. So we have to analyze the template. And for analyzing the template, we first have to 
remove values, which are the same for all the environments. So we collected all the properties, but if we change the environment and the property value doesn't change, that doesn't give us any information about the environment. It's just a static value. So, for example, the, the name of an array is array, so that's the same for all the environments. It doesn't matter in, on which environment you execute the code, so we can simply remove that. Um, if you remove all the duplicate values here in the analysis phase, we are left with some of the properties that are actually different because of the environment. Some of them are really obvious. For example, the navigator platform, which the use is to indicate the platform the code is running on. So this should change if we change the environment. So we can see here it's running on Linux, it's running on Android, and it's running on Windows. And this should tell us the environment. Could, of course, be anonymized, which is the case for the Tor browser, but in other browsers we get this value. These are the obvious ones we're not really interested in. The interesting, interesting ones are the ones that leak information about the environment, but they are not defined to do so. For example, here in this small uh, example, we see the window sh shared worker. And this property implements some uh, multi-threading functionality, and this is not available on Android uh, at the time of writing the paper. So we can see from that property, if it's null or undefined, then we know we're not running on Windows or Linux, but we're running on a mobile browser. So this already gives us some information which, not, which is not intended to leak through this property. So these are a lot of properties we can already find, the static properties, but we can also extend this approach by adding artificial properties. We can define properties at runtime in JavaScript uh, to give us more properties that can then be collected. And we do that before the exploration, the profiling phase, and uh, we, for example, can define results of functions as properties. And then we get even more information about the environment. And for this, we introduce two new side channel attacks on the JavaScript just-in-time compiler. They are useless as side channel attacks, but they are interesting to infer the environment for uh, targeting uh, for exports. For example, one of the side channels, we detect the internal, internal memory allocator size. So we see how large chunks are that the, uh, that the memory allocator in the browser allocates, which can be interesting for a lot of exploits because many, many exploits in JavaScript actually exploit the memory allocator. And we do that by iterating over arrays and seeing timing differences when the internal memory allocator has to reallocate memory. The second side channel we found is to distinguish 32-bit from 64-bit architectures by uh, actually um, exploiting the limitations of the just-in-time compiler of the number of registers that is different on 64-bit and 32-bit architectures. And then we can see whether we are on a 32 or 64-bit architecture. For the memory allocator side channel, so this is the histogram, and we can see for Chrome, we have the highest peak for 512 kilobytes. This is the block size of the Chrome memory allocator. And for Firefox, we have the highest peak at one megabyte. We see the highest timing differences there, which gives us the internal size of the memory allocator chunks for Firefox. This allows to distinguish Firefox from Chrome, for example, if you don't have anything else. The same for the 32-bit and 64-bit. We have two quite similar snippets that do basically the same thing, just as one operation more. If you're on 64-bit computers, we don't really care because we have a lot of registers and all the operations can be kept in registers. But for 32-bit system, we are missing one of the registers for, for one of the results. So the just in time compiler has to use the memory, making this code snippet extremely, uh, more, a lot more slower than the other code snippet. And we can see that on the timing differences, that if you're on a 32-bit system, one of the code snippets is a lot more slower. This allows us to reliably distinguish 32 from 64-bit systems. So we've seen we can find a lot of properties, add some properties. What were the actual results we have found, some interesting results? We were able to distinguish all the browser versions. 
and not only browsers, but also the exact version. So we've seen that because a lot of properties are available, a lot of properties differ. We found nearly 6,000 different property values between Firefox and Chrome because of different functionality, implementation details, for example, how a function is represented if you call the two string functionality on a function. So on all the 40 tested browsers we have, we can distinguish them exactly just by looking at the number and the value of properties. We can also see installed privacy extensions because most of them modify, change, or add or remove some of the properties in the browser. And by that, we can see whether the user has, for example, Canvas Defender installed to protect against fingerprinting. And as Canvas Defender only renames the original properties, they can still be accessed, and so it allows us to automatically circumvent this extension as well. We've also seen properties that allow us to distinguish normal mode from private mode in the Firefox and Edge. We can see the operating system using, for example, support of virtual reality displays, uh, different font dimensions, we can see the CPU vendor from WebGL properties. We can even see whether we are in a virtual machine or not, also from WebGL properties or some really strange screen resolutions. So you can all try that out yourself as well. The whole code for that is on GitHub. It's easy to run. It's just a local server and you browse it on with different environments in the same browser and then you see the properties that leak information about the environment. So as a future work, we want to uh, add some functions and the values of function returns, but this turned out to be a bit tricky because you need to know the semantics of functions. It's a bit like you have to fast the functions first and uh, then you get the properties of the functions and functions have side effects, so this is a tricky part. Also going for new web standards like web NFC, web USB, because they require some user interaction. And we also looked at non-static properties, like timestamps that could be used uh, as a histogram uh, to also use fingerprinting. So we have seen this template index allow to automatically detect properties that leak information about the environment and can thus be used to target users, use a perfect exploits for users or for fingerprinting and can be used for browser vendors as well to find leakage like in a Tor browser. Okay, so thanks for your attention. Um, so some of the things that you presented, like you know, automatically discovering all the properties, seem completely automated, right? Yes. But then some other things, like the timing attacks and how fast you will be able to see, you know, uh, how many. The timing attacks through which you infer the number of registers, these don't seem to be automated. Like you had to go in and devise such a test that yes. you run on multiple browsers, right? That's so, correct, yeah. So, you know, how much of your findings are essentially, you know, would have been discovered in a completely automated fashion and how much, you know, you still need the person to devise such a test? Uh, so that's correct. So the two session attacks, they were manually, they were before that. And we just added the results of them for the JavaScript template attacks. Everything else is completely automated. So if you look back at the, the results here, for example, uh, detecting uh, virtual machines, operating systems, CPU vendors, private mode, this is all completely automated. So of course you have to make sense by starting to correct experiments. So you start the browser once in normal mode, once in private mode. The tool gives you properties that differ and from that you know, okay, right. they are different because of this mode change here. Right, okay. And just one quick question. So you call your attacks JavaScript template attacks. Are these yeah. different than differential analysis? Um, where you run really. the same tests on different no. environments? So template attacks are usually kind of the same thing. So you, okay. you conduct an experiment, you get a measurement, then you change one of the environments, and you do that again, and mm -hmm. you put it in a huge table, okay. and then you look for differences there. So that would be differential analysis then? Yeah. All right, okay. All right, let's thank the speaker again.